Welcome to an introduction to accounting, brought to you by Parkbench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. For more information about Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com. This podcast is the first of those relating to adjustments in the preparation of financial statements. We shall explore the link between the balance sheet and the income statement, how the income statement is structured, and then look at a number of adjustments that are usually made. Starting with cost of sales, we shall see how inventories are valued. Then, in a further podcast, we shall look at accruals, prepayments and bad debts. The income statement is also referred to as the profit and loss account. It reflects that part of the accounting equation that defines profit. Remember that the accounting equation is assets less liabilities equals equity. Profit is equal to revenues less expenses and the income statement shows the profit or loss over a stated period of time. You will have noted that the heading to an income statement will state the period to which it refers. The profit or loss for an entity is the difference between total revenues and total expenses for the accounting period. The entity receives revenues from the provision of goods and services to customers, the customer being expected to pay for the goods or services. Revenue will represent an increase in the owner's interest in equity, and revenues also increase net assets. Expenses relate to the cost of providing the goods or services to the customers. They are the activities needed to carry on the business, and will include employment of labour, the use of utilities and advertising. A decrease in net assets takes place when expenses are incurred. Liabilities will increase if expenses are on credit, until the amounts are settled. Expenses decrease the owner's interest in the equity. How do we determine when to recognise revenues and expenses? The entity will be following standards that require accounting to be carried out on an accrual basis. Revenue and expenses recognition will then follow the matching principle, recording when they occur rather than when payment is received or made. So when is a sale actually made? The guidance is that when ownership and control pass to the buyer, the goods are accepted by the buyer. Sounds easy, but wait a minute. The goods have been shipped out and are in transit. Who owns the goods? Ownership is determined under the Sale of Goods Act, Section 18, Rule 1, Goods in a Deliverable State. Where there is an unconditional contract for the sale of specific goods in a deliverable state, the property in the goods passes to the buyer when the contract is made. The Act also defines sale or return conditions. Any other contract should indicate when ownership passes to the buyer. Let us consider the structure of the income statement. We start by considering the total sales revenue. In this case we shall say it was 100 million. Now we enter the figure for the cost of sales. In this case we shall say it was 60 million. We are now in a position to determine the gross profit. We subtract cost of sales from sales revenue to obtain a figure of 40 million. We now start to enter other costs that relate to expenses of selling. First, a distribution cost, which we will put at 5 million. Now, the additional administrative expenses, such as the utilities and any rent and so forth, let us say the figure is 10 million. Now, we shall subtract these expenses from the gross profit to leave an operating profit of 25 million. Finally, enter any finance costs. We will enter a figure of 5 million. This means we can now determine the profit before any taxation. The figure will be 20 million. We will assume profit has been taxed at 25%, so 25% of 20 million is 5 million. Subtracting this figure, we are left with the profit for the period. This completes our income statement. In practice, there are adjustments that need to be made before the figures for the income statement are complete. These adjustments relate to the closing inventory, accruals and prepayments, bad debts and depreciation. We will next consider the closing inventory. Closing inventory is used in the determination of cost of sales. 
cost of sales is equal to the closing inventory plus purchases plus the closing inventory. The closing inventory is then recorded as the lower value of cost or net realizable value. How do we measure cost? Cost includes the cost of production and any expenses necessary to get the inventory to the present location and condition. The net realizable value is the sales value less any costs in selling the inventory. If stock has been damaged or is obsolete, then its value may be lower than cost. Manufacturers of high-tech items such as laptops will not hold large stocks since advances can speedily reduce the value of these machines. Let us have a simple example for closing inventory. We have opening inventory of 3,000, closing inventory of 10,000, sales 70,000 and purchases of 30,000. We also know the net realizable value of the closing inventory is 12,000. We need to calculate cost of sales and gross profit. The first figure we need to enter is sales. Sales were 70,000. To determine the cost of sales we need to start with the opening inventory which is 3000. We need to add this to any value of any purchases in this case 30000 subtract the value for the closing inventory which is 8000 leaving us with a figure for cost of sales of 25000. Subtract the cost of sales from sales, we take 25,000 from 70,000, we're left with a gross profit of 45,000. The example that we use stated a value for inventory. How is this value determined? When we make purchases for inventory, the price may vary with each purchase. Which value should we use? When a new car is sold by the dealer, then the car can easily be identified and the actual price paid to the manufacturer is known. This is not typical. Consider bags of cement. When we sell a bag of cement, we are not likely to know which particular bag we are selling. Accounting has three different ways of determining a value for inventory. These are first in and first out, last in and first out, and the average cost. A number of assumptions are made for each method. For FIFO, first in first out, we assume goods that arrive first are the first sold. For LIFO, last in first out, we assume that the goods which arrived last are the first sold. The newest units are the ones being sold. Under international standards this method is not permitted unless inventory were to be actually sold like this. Under AVCO, the assumption is that all goods are issued at an average price of the inventory that is held. Here we're going to work through a typical example to show the effect of using FIFO and AFCO. The first thing we need to do is to determine the number of units we have left in inventory. We purchased 250 units and we sold a total of 170 units. So the number of units left in inventory must be 80. Using FIFO let us see which units were sold. Clearly, if 170 units have been sold, then all of the units purchased on the 1st of January for £10 have been sold, there are still another 20 units to account for. These units must have come from inventory received on the 20th of January. That leaves the 80 units that are left in a batch that cost £15 a unit. So the closing inventory has a value of 80 times 15, which equals £1,200. We can also show this another way. The total cost of the units sold was 80 units at £10, 70 units at £10 and 20 units at £15, giving a total of £1,800. Subtract this from £3,000 and we are left with £1,200. FIFO best reflects the movement of physical inventory and when prices are rising the closing inventory will reflect most recent prices. The cost of sales will use the oldest and lowest prices. Now let us do the same calculation using AVCO, the average cost per unit being calculated. We have a total of £3,000 as cost for the units and 250 units for sale, so the cost per unit is £12. The cost of sales will be 170 times 12, £2,040. 
The closing inventory will be 80 times 12, 960 pounds. AFCO determines the weighted average after each purchase of inventory. This becomes cumbersome when there are a large number of purchases at different prices. However, cost of goods sold and closing inventory are determined using the same average cost, so there is less cost distortion. We shall now consider how the three methods give different figures to use and their effects. For cost of sales, it is clear that FIFO gives the lowest cost and LIFO the highest. This means that the closing inventory will be highest in FIFO and lowest in LIFO. The lower the cost of sales, the higher the gross profit. So FIFO gives the highest gross profit, and LIFO the lowest gross profit. Finally, FIFO will have the highest values for inventory valuation on the balance sheet, and LIFO will have the lowest valuation. We can then use the different methods of valuation for inventory and see what effect they have on the balance sheet and the income statement. This ends our first podcast on adjustments brought to you by Parkbench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. We wish you success in your studies. For further information about Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com.